Welcome to the Hill Update. I'm your host, Dean Allison, Member of Parliament for Niagara West. Here is your update on what's been happening in Ottawa over the past week. Members of Parliament continue to debate the speech from the throne. Some of the highlights revolve around the effectiveness of the government's pandemic relief programs and the rising cost of living. Also, the government reintroduced a bill banning conversion therapy, Bill C-4. This bill will make it a crime to cause another person to undergo conversion therapy and make it a criminal offence to promote or profit from providing the practice. There is widespread agreement among all parties that conversion therapy is wrong and should be banned. Most people believe that no Canadian should be forced to change who they are. This legislation had already passed by the House of Commons and was awaiting the final stages of the debate before an election was called. And prior to the election, concerns were raised that the previous government bill may inadvertently criminalize conversations between individuals and their parents, spiritual leaders, and medical professionals. The opposition conservatives said that they hoped that the government had taken these concerns into account to put forward a bill that everyone can support, and that there would be no need to table the legislation again if the prime minister hadn't called an election, which effectively killed his own government's legislation that would have made this practice illegal. However, in a surprise move this week, the Conservatives asked for unanimous consent to deem C4 passed through all stages in the House of Commons. The unanimous consent was received. This legislation will now be in the hands of Senators who may still want to seek some changes. Another issue being vigorously discussed by parliamentarians is the labour shortage crisis. A survey conducted by the Canadian manufacturers and exporters found that most manufacturers are facing more acute labour shortages this year than they faced last year. The survey found that 82% of respondents are facing labour shortages and 75% of their hiring troubles are even worse than last year. Dennis Darby, president of the CME, said that this is probably the worst labour shortage he has seen. The information gathered also found that the lack of workers and material shortages have caused the manufacturing sector's recovery to grind to a near halt. Darby points out that small companies always have trouble because they often have a hard time competing on wages. But big companies are also looking for skilled trade workers, and they can't get them. In addition, 42% of the CME's survey respondents said their companies lost or turned down contracts or paid late delivery penalties because of a lack of workers, and about 17% said the shortages were causing them to consider moving work outside of Canada. This labour shortage isn't just limited to the manufacturing sector, it's being felt across many industries and is having a tremendous negative impact on supply chains. Lastly, the government is once again dealing with illegal migration at Roxham Road in Quebec. According to the CBSA spokesman, Sandro Boudreau, the Canadian government is accepting asylum in refugee claims of unvaccinated illegal border crossers. Upon arrival, asymptomatic claimants who don't have a quarantine plan will be temporarily housed in government facilities before being released when the quarantine period is over. On the same note, as of Tuesday, unvaccinated Canadians are no longer able to board a plane or a passenger train in Canada. Additionally, Canadians are hoping to return from abroad must be vaccinated or not show any COVID-19 symptoms. They must also meet other requirements such as a quarantine plan. Joining me on the show today is Jocelyn Bamford, host of the show Canadian Innovators. She is also the Vice President of Automatic Coding Limited and the founder of the Coalition of Concerned Manufacturers. Jocelyn, thanks for joining me on the show today. My pleasure. I'd love to be here. We only got about a minute and a half in this segment, but I wanted to get started. Uh, the trade ministers down in Washington just went down this week because apparently we may have a few trade irritants going on here. Uh, I know one of them for sure is softwood lumber, right? They almost uh, double tariffs. And the second thing is the uh, proposed tax credits that the U.S. is looking for only by American and electric vehicles. Let's talk about that such important relationship that we have with our U.S. Yeah, and, and it's a tragedy because back in the har- days of the Harper government, Canada had an exemption to buy America, and we don't have that anymore. So we've actually lost ground in negotiations with the United States. And I would argue, because we continue to send people that aren't qualified down to negotiate these deals, you need a business professional to go down and negotiate these deals. And, and Canada doesn't know what's going to happen to it. We have a train going towards us called Buy America, and it's going to definitely impact Canadian manufacturers. You know, this is something that we have, you just mentioned it. We've had to deal with this over the years. We probably should have been able to see this coming. Absolutely. We, we've been talking about it at the coalition for the last two years, being concerned about Buy America, and now it's come to fruition, and we didn't see any movement in negotiating an exemption for Canada, which is going to be devastating to Canadian manufacturers. 
Well, here we are. Uh, one time, it's like we've already seen this show. We're going to see it one more time. Well, let's go to break right now. And uh, when we come back from break, we're going to talk a bit about uh, COP26 and what happened just recently. Joining me on the show today, I have Jocelyn Bamford, who is the host of Canadian Innovators. Jocelyn, thanks for joining me on the show today. I think we should just touch base because it sets into context what's happening with the throne speech. Let's just touch on COP26. So, you know, that happened back a month or so ago, like thousands of delegates, thousands of planes from, I think there was 39,000 people registered and I think there may be 10, 20,000 people showed up. Absolutely. And, and what that shows is how the elites are completely out of touch how you can fly your private plane to talk about climate issues and not realize that that is uh, completely not appropriate is beyond me. I mean, we have the technology to zoom in. So if they were really concerned about the environment, if it was all about the environment, why wouldn't they arrange a conference that's based on technology and not having all of these private planes fly in? I mean, it seems like these folks have absolutely no shame if you if you were going to do that. And it absolutely shows the hypocrisy of the elites and the people in the environmental movement. It's not about the environment. It's not about people. It's about their woke movement and fueling this economy that that makes money on environmental issues and not what real people need to have a better life. Well, you know, I, I just read an article in the Western Standard saying that we had the largest delegation, I think, over 277 bureaucrats. And, you know, so we have the, all the people there showing the hypocrisy. But the other issue I have is in terms of what our prime minister actually committed to Canada there and what he was pushing in terms of a worldwide carbon tax, as well as, you know, what he's going to do to reduce emissions and cap emissions here in Canada. Right, and, and you, you need to sort of set the stage for what Canada contributes in terms of greenhouse gases to the world. We're less than 1.4% of total emissions to the world. And our resource sector can be the solution to a cleaner planet. If we could get our liquefied natural gas to market, we could have China and India come off coal. So climate doesn't stop at our borders. If they're really concerned, they would have a solution that looks at how we can contribute with our great technology to a cleaner planet. But they don't, because it's not really about the environment after all. Well, and we also know that uh, the largest emitters don't actually sign on to try and reduce it. We've got China, we've got Russia, we've got India. Uh, they don't sign on to try and do anything. They create most of the emissions. Right. So when you look at, you know, the analogy would be in Canada, we're 1.4% of greenhouse gases. It's like you being 100 pounds and your neighbor being overweight and you having gastric bypass surgery. It makes no sense. Uh, let's have solutions that help the world and help Canada as well, because we could have prosperity in a cleaner planet if we got our resources to market. So let's do that. All right, so we had trade issues that we're dealing with. We had the uh, speech from the throne. We had the COP26. So the reason I wanted to talk about COP26, because that leads into the throne speech. I just, any any thoughts initially, because what's been happening in the last couple of weeks, we're still debating in the House. Give me your initial thoughts on the speech from the throne. So if you're a Canadian, go on Canada.ca and look at the throne speech, and you will see an absolute word salad of wokeism. It is absolutely insane. Um, it talks about nothing that average Canadians want to talk about. That's jobs, inflation, the economy, um, affordability. None of those things are talked about. They also didn't talk about bringing back manufacturing, having a manufacturing strategy. We knew what happened during COVID when we didn't have gloves and gowns and ventilators. And now we're finding out in Canada with supply chain issues that we don't have supply chains that are manufactured here. And they didn't address any of that. So again, it goes back to how out of touch the elites are with the pain that ordinary Canadians feel. We want jobs for our kids, we want prosperity, and we could have all that if we had good policy. Well, it's interesting because you mentioned not, not no mention of inflation, labor issues are competitors. Right, and you talk to any manufacturer right now and labor shortages, we have an aging workforce of skilled labor and we have nothing to backfill it. So, you know, you just drive down a main street, go to a Tim Hortons drive through or a McDonald's drive through They all have signs in their window that say they want labor from manufacturing to retail. And there was no strategy to talk about getting Canada back to work. So they missed almost every point, but there was a lot of woke stuff in there 
all the talking points about the environment and climate change, all of the stuff that they want to talk about that really doesn't impact your ability to feed your family and buy groceries. And, you know, if you filled up your gas tank or went to go buy a pound of bacon, holy smokes, it is oppressive. And there was nothing in there to address that. And it's because they don't feel the same pain. They don't have the same priorities that we do. Well, you know, and I think that it's going to lead into our next uh, topic. We come back from break. Uh, C2, which is pandemic benefits. So we talked about the throne speech, not having a lot in there for business, competitiveness, even deal with the whole inflation issue. So when we come back from break, let's talk about C2, which is uh, the pandemic, you know, continuation of trying to help uh, businesses out. When we come back. Welcome back. Joining me on the show, I've got uh, Jocelyn Bamford, who is the host of Canadian Innovators. Jocelyn, glad to have you back. Uh, we were talking just before break about uh, the, you know, the, the speech on the throne. We can keep talking about that, but one of the things that we're also debating in the House, or will be, that's just been introduced, is Bill C-2, which is on pandemic benefits. Now, while you may not have read the whole bill, and sometimes not all MPs read all the bills, <laughs> uh, they're really talking about, it's their thought process, the government's thought process, of how they can help businesses. And what I've noticed from reading it, and I don't know if you had a ta- chance to talk to any other uh, businesses in your group, uh, but really the, the threshold for being able to help people seems to be very high. And it doesn't seem to me like there's gonna be a whole lot of support, even though they're talking about it, and it's, it appears like they're trying, it doesn't seem like it's gonna really you know, meet the people on the ground. Right, and, and the other part of that is we really need to have accountability. And there doesn't seem that in any of this pandemic spending, there's accountability. So, I mean, even if you look at some of the contracts that we gave out for ventilators, we haven't had an update on those. Where are they in the delivery cycle? How much did they cost us? Have they even been delivered at all? And so when you're shoveling out money, you need to make sure you have accountability because otherwise you're feeding inflation. And that's what's causing people to have pain when they're filling up their gas tank or going to buy their groceries. And we also need to have a solid plan to get people back to work. And as I've said previously in our last segment, you know, you see help wanted signs everywhere. Everybody needs help. So let's focus on getting people back to work, uh, getting manufacturing up and running. And there's so much opportunity. We found so much innovation during COVID that can be manufactured in Canada. And again, we're seeing supply chain challenges. So let's focus on getting people back to work, helping businesses get through some of the certification hoops that they need. Mm -hmm. And let's make sure we're competitive. And one of the worst things in Canada is we have unaffordable energy. Mm -hmm. And why do we have unaffordable energy? Because we're not getting our energy to market. And we have a federal government that's content in driving out the resource sector. So if we could reverse some of those things, get our resource sector going, we could have jobs in the economy. And some of these... uh, pain points that we're feeling won't be so hard. Yeah. What, a couple of comments from uh, Canadian Chamber of Commerce said that uh, they're pleased that the Liberals made the, you know, the pri- proposed legislation a priority. I know that one of the things that was said by Dan Kelly, uh, the CEO of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, said, uh, you know, it's great. He had mixed reviews because it relates to the eligibility criteria the business supports. And so, one of the things that you're saying at the end of the day is that we need to get businesses up and running again. And when we target or we we try to incentivize things that people can't get to or it's not you know important to them, that creates the challenge. Because he's saying like you know that that's still going to be a, a challenge for people to even access some of these programs, which was always part of the conversation during the pandemic was access to the programs. Right, exactly, and and especially on the small business side. That, that was the segment that was harmed the most. They were harmed the most because of lockdowns while the large corporations kept rolling, the small businesses, a lot of them were shut out. But, but when you talk about some of the comments, especially from some of the business association, a lot of people don't realize that a lot of business association get grants from the federal government. So you have to take some of the comments with a grain of salt and figure out what business associations actually are funded from the federal government and which ones aren't. And then, and then take your advice uh, with a grain of salt from those that do get funded from the federal government. Yeah, no, and I think, you know, that's a, that's a great point because, you know, uh, governments love, all governments, you know, all stripes love to talk about the great programs that they put in place, right? But once again, if you can't access the program, if there's no fit or it doesn't make sense. And we saw that during the first part of the pandemic, you know, where, you know, the, the, the thresholds are too high for businesses to even hope, hope to uh, obtain. And so I think, you know, that's what's being said here now. If you're going to say that we have to be down 40 or 50 percent, 
not all businesses were down 40 or 50 percent. They may have been down 15 or 20 or 25 percent, which is still significant, but doesn't let them access some of the programs. Right. And that that when you're down 10 or 20 percent, that's your profit margin. Absolutely. The, you know, if people don't realize the profit margin in manufacturing are very slim. So you have to be running on all cylinders to actually make a profit. But better than th shoveling money at people is create an environment that we can compete. So carbon tax, it is devastating on manufacturers. Um, clean fuel standards, which is coming down the pipe, also makes things uncompetitive. The green energy program in Ontario that was brought out by the Wynn Liberals also make it very unaffordable for electricity. So create a competitive environment and then you don't have to shovel subsidies at them. But they're more uh, inclined to to want to control everything, leave it unaffordable for us to operate. And that's why you see a lot of businesses moving either growth or their business to the United States. And with that goes jobs and innovation and technology. So all of those are bad things. Well, when we come back from uh, break, we're going to talk about some of those things. Uh, you know, what is the culture like now in uh, business? And do we need to worry about more businesses moving south of the border when we come back from break? Welcome back to the Hill Update. We've got uh, Jocelyn Bamford on the show today, who is the host of Canadian Innovators. Jocelyn, thanks again for being on the show today. All right, last segment. Let's tie it all together. All right, so we're talking about you know climate change. We're talking about speech to the throne. We're not seeing a lot to actually stimulate or encourage good practices for our Canadian businesses. So let's talk about what is the actual climate. You've got a membership, a large membership. They must be getting pulled. They must be having issues. Where are they at in terms of remaining in Canada or thinking about leaving? So, you know, we have a board of 14 members and of the 14 members, three, three of them have, during the last two years, started to relocate to the United States or have gone to the United States. And, and that is just a reflection of the Canadian uh, landscape right now. So, I, you know, I see four things happening since the time that we started the coalition and most of it driven from unaffordable energy. So we have unaffordable energy and we have taxes. So we're competing with product that have come in from offshore without any of those. Um, we have infrastructure projects that large um, integrators offshore everything and all the high value manufacturing fabrication, do it offshore and bring it in. So we're, and then we have buy American states. So we're just, it's death by a thousand cuts. And we're seeing people do one of four things. They're either moving all outright, they're moving growth. So they were going to grow here, but they're going to grow in the United States, selling out to large multinationals or just closing up shop. We had a couple of entrepreneurs that just said, I'm out. And that, and that costs jobs. And they don't do it because they have to or they want to. They do it because they're forced from policy from our own government. So that makes it uncompetitive. So that's the tragedy. It's not that they can't compete in the world, they can, we can compete with anybody, we have the best innovation, but our government saddling us on the federal level with all of these additional costs that make it impossible to compete. And, and when you sell out to large multinationals, the, you, you lose the control in Canada and that makes decisions that are maybe made on bottom line dollars, whereas a lot of small to medium sized business, we're a family with our employees. We will do anything to keep our employees happy. Uh, when you have ownership that's in a different country, they don't have that connection. So all of these things are bad for the Canadian economy. And we could fix it with a good couple of policies, one for our strategy for our resource sector, one strategy for manufacturing and one strategy for agriculture. I'm not seeing any of that from the federal government right now. Well, yeah, and the other thing that's interesting, that you talked about the carbon tax on what people don't understand. It's, you know, you've got a carbon tax on energy, which is what you need in your business, mm -hmm. but then you've got to ship that and then you've got to get resources in. There's a whole uh, supply chain that has to pay that on every single item. So it's compounded and you just hit the nail on the head. If, you're, if we're buying goods from China or we're, being, we're buying oil from Saudi Arabia, Mm -hmm. That's a great example. They don't are not worried about any of those things. They come in, and it's like we're competing with one arm tied behind our back. We a hundred percent are, and it's again death by a thousand cuts. And it's our own government that's doing it to us, not other governments outside of us or other forces, market forces. So, you know, just allow us to compete, uh, and we will. We'll show the world that we can have the best products and the greatest innovation but don't make us operate with our hands tied behind our backs. 
All right, we just got a little over a minute left in this uh, in the show here. Let's talk a bit about labor. I mean, you talked about the smaller companies have got the ability to, you know, be more family orientated. I think we've got some of the most innovative people in the world. We've got a great country, natural resources. Talk to us about the labor market and what's going on after after the last year and a half, 20 months we've had. So we have an aging workforce and skilled labor. We've, in most of the school boards, they took our shop classes out and, and completely got rid of all the technical skilled labor. So we're lacking in, in skilled labor. Um, people aren't being attracted to manufacturing because they're not exposed to it when they're in those high school years, when they're making decisions. And so we need to reinstitute skilled labor into Canada and train our kids on how exciting manufacturing is, because it really is. There's so many facets to it, and it's a great way to have a career. So um, this is a, an issue that we are really going to be faced with and we need to address. Well, listen, thank you very much for being on the show today. Uh, you know, we, we've, got the, we've got the greatest country in the world, but it's almost, uh, we do these things to ourselves sometimes, right? We create the wrong policies, which then encourage businesses to look elsewhere. So thank you for joining us on the show. Until next time, uh, thank you for coming to join us on the Hill Update, and we look forward to seeing you next time around. <music>